Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I had a really interesting interview a couple of months ago with uh, uh, Guratan Singh, who is the member of provincial parliament for Brampton East, uh, and he's the uh, the critic for the New Democratic Party for the Attorney General. And we had an interesting conversation about uh, some of the issues that were prevalent uh, within the uh, the provincial government at the time. And so I thought I'd check back with him, number one, to find out what's going on with the NDP and, and the province of Ontario, but also because my sense is he's got a really interesting backstory. And I wanted to hear a little bit more about him because I think you'd be interested in hearing a little bit of more him. Guratan, welcome to our show. How are you today? It's, uh, it, it's a pleasure to be back, Brian. And we did have a really uh, amazing chat last time. And I've been uh, looking forward to chatting with you again. I'm doing great. Uh, Lots change, a lot of developments happened since we last spoke. I, I, get a, I have a beautiful baby girl, a daughter, Mahakur. Oh, congratulations. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a, a new addition to the family. And uh, so along with the, you know, the trials and tribulations that COVID has, bring, has brought, I'm also, you know, I have a, a little bit of joy as well through the, through the family getting bigger. Now, the big issue uh, last time we chatted was uh, insurance rates in uh, Brampton. Uh, but that was, I think, uh, either before COVID-19 or just at the beginning of COVID-19. What are the big issues that you're dealing with today, sir? So when we talk about Brampton East specifically, we talk about a, a variety of issues. So first of all, the riding that I represent is one of the worst hit in the country by COVID-19. So we have, uh, you know, a rampant uh, situation in Brampton East. But the problem is that, you know, a lot of it, the discourse after talking to Michael uh, Lawrence Lowe, rather, the uh, chief medical officer in Peel, he described that this is because Brampton's full of essential workers. We're a city full of people who don't have the privilege of working from home. They have to go to work. In fact, because they go to work, they move the economy and others can work from home. So uh, we're dealing with that COVID uh, outbreak, but in tandem with the underfunding of our healthcare system, which has really exasperated the already pre-existing weaknesses of our healthcare system. That is top of mind. Auto insurance is still something that folks are really worried about because it comes into this issue of affordability at a time where everyone's really struggling, they're looking for a break in, in any place. And uh, uh, auto insurance is something that in our riding, the riding I represent, one of the, the most expensive, uh, um, you know, costs that people have to incur. So these are still the issues. I would say the healthcare crisis, affordability, and just people worried. They're worried about their loved ones, their family getting sick from COVID-19. And this is the top of mind for everyone. And as a critic for Attorney General, what, uh, what are you faced with? We we had a lot of uh, a lot of uh, you know bills that have come forward that have been directly tied into um, COVID. We've had the you know legislation being for, put forward that we from the NDP and a lot of experts said um, was actually going to protect for profit long term care uh, facilities from being held to account because of the protections put forward in the in the bill by the Conservative government. Something that we were really against. We talk about, uh, in general, just uh, legislation being put forward that's limiting accountability of the government. And we're saying at a time of COVID-19, we need to make sure that government is being held to a higher standard of account, not to a lower standard of account. So that's some of the stuff that we're dealing with as a critic for Attorney General. And, uh, you know, I think the other thing that we wanted to talk about today, which we'll do after a message, if it's okay, is I wanted to get a little bit of your background, because I think it's so fascinating that both you and your brother are involved in politics, um, that uh, both of you are so incredibly articulate, uh, that you are uh, both progressive and, uh, and interested uh, as, you, uh, as you are in social justice in so many different ways. So we're gonna take a break for some messages and come back more uh, after a break with Guratan Singh, the member of provincial parliament for Brampton East, uh, the critic for uh, attorney general, and hear about his own personal uh, story. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with Guratan Singh, who is the member of provincial parliament uh, for Brampton East. Uh, he's also the uh, critic for the Attorney General in the New Democratic Party in Queen's Park. And um, my sense is, uh, Guratan, that you've got an interesting story. So if I could uh, tell me, you know, both you and your brother, uh, who is the leader of the Democratic Party uh, federally, have been motivated to get involved in politics. Why are you involved in politics? It's a, it's a really great question. And uh, it's a conversation and a question that gets put to me quite often. Uh, I would say that the, my background before politics, even before my brother was involved in politics, was around community organizing. Uh, in my younger days, I, you know, I was with a group of young folks, and we worked around, uh, around a lot of issues on social justice. And what we saw is that our elected officials, through organizing in our community and working around issues from everything, quite frankly, from, from housing and affordability to human rights across the world, 
we saw that there was a gap in our representation to the issues that really matter to us as young people. This is, you know, back 10 years ago when I used to call myself a young person. And um, at that time, uh, we saw there was a gap in our representation. And we, amongst ourselves as young folks, we came together and we said, you know what? We need to put someone forward who can really champion our, our issues and our cause and really be a voice to us. Because we didn't, we didn't feel that uh, representation from the people who were elected at that time. So it was a buddy of mine, he actually, his name's Amit Singh, and he came up with this idea. He called me one day, he said, listen, Bratan had this amazing idea. I'm like, what? He's like, your brother, Jake Mead, should run for politics. And I said, really? He's like, yeah, he, he brought it down. He's like, hey, listen, he's randomly, he's fluent in French. He's, he's well-spoken. He's a lawyer. He's, he's someone who, you know, is respected in the community. He'd be a great uh, representative. And I was like, no, I, was, I wasn't really the most political individual. as well in activism, but not... I hadn't turned my mind truly to, to politics that time. And I said, you know, I think it makes sense. And so him and I actually encouraged my brother to get into politics. And uh, we played good cop, bad cop. So I was, and my brother blames me, uh, gives me, he, he, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, brings it up every now and then. He's like, you were, you were a bad guy for a little bit because I was, you know, a little bit pressuring him in a, in, a, in a very active, assertive way to say, listen, you are such a good representative. You would be such a good representative. You need to run for politics. And he, he was comfortable as a lawyer at that time. But when I was able to pitch to him with this, this is my friend Amneet, this idea that we could fight for a better world, fight for a better politics, fight for a better province uh, and a better country because he ran federally first, that really convinced him. And that was what started this path of politics. Were you uh, both always interested in the new Democratic Party? And if so, why? So we were always progressives. And I had always, uh, you know, voted new Democrat, for, uh, I'd always voted NDP before that. And I'd, but I wasn't like a card carrying member at that time. I just something that I, I felt uh, my voice heard in, in the party, and it was really Jack Layton who inspired us all. That was uh, at a time where, you know, I, I, a lot of the credit goes to the fact that he provided such amazing leadership. And for a young person who was dreaming for a better world and continues to dream for a better world, I saw that leadership within Jack. And Jack had, had stood alongside these issues of social justice that were really near and dear to us. And so th that had always, you know, made that a prospect that was interesting to us. So when we had the opportunity to run, when we thought about it, our immediate thought was, let's go to the NDP. You know, it's interesting if you take a look at uh, the the U.S. election uh, recently, which you know I've been uh, as a news junkie and a political junkie just fascinated with, and you may have uh, looked at it a little bit. There really is within the the, the Democratic Party in the United States uh, people comparable to the progressives that would be in the uh, the new Democratic Party in Canada, but also people that would make up the Liberal Party of Canada, and frankly, even some people. Um, in the center, uh, center left, that I think would be more akin to almost some people at the the left hand side of the of the progressive conservative party or the conservative party of Canada. So it's a really a, a wide uh, tent uh, in the United States, and you know it appears that that tent has been somewhat successful, uh, uh, winning the presidential election. And you can see in the in the formation of the cabinet that the progressives, the people comparable to the NDP, are sort of trying to get their policies in place. Um, and uh, you know maybe motivating slash pushing the uh, the the center um, of the Democratic Party toward that. That's not the way it happens in Canada with the separation of the progressive or the center left into the two different parties: the New Democratic Party and the Liberal Party. Don't you think you'd be more successful if you merged with the Liberal Party and did like AOC and Bernie Sanders and others are doing in pushing the center left party to adopt your rules, but then end up having um, enough weight such that you could actually win majority government. It's a, it's a really uh, interesting conversation. It's a really interesting point. I remember I actually heard a, a uh, article, I think by AOC, Alexander Orte Ortega Cortez, where she said, um, um, you know, in any other country, they wouldn't be in the same party. And when she's talking about herself and other uh, Democrats. So I think we've, we've seen in America that example uh, rings true that people often in, in other countries wouldn't be there together. But I think when we look at the history of Canada uh, and we, we look at our really rich history of progressives in Canada, the NDP in Canada has always, in my opinion, uh, Canada's better off when the NDP has more seats. And when we look at uh, forming government, when the NDP forms government, we've seen the amazing impact of it across uh, our country. When we look at right now, you know, we always, I've, I often have been pointing at the BC NDP in, uh, in BC and uh, John Horgan, and the amazing work that they're doing, that the fact that, you know, they're, they've all, you know, all in all, when you look at their province compared to other provinces, they've done a really fantastic job. They, you know, they have struggles like anyone else, but they've done a really fantastic job of providing supports to people who are in need, uh, from rental support to people who sit through the, the cracks of CERB. 
to also uh, just in making sure that the, 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 you know, the actual cases of COVID-19 have been held and, and been contained comparatively much better. Look at it federally uh, with the work that, you know, I'm very proud of the work that my brother has done. But with his advocacy, you know, he's not getting enough credit for this, but uh, CERB was something that my brother had proposed beforehand. The payroll support was something my brother had, uh, Junior Singh, the leader of the NDP, had, had uh, put forward beforehand, uh, including students uh, in the CERB protections. Uh, it's something my brother, brother Junior Singh, had, had proposed beforehand. So you see uh, the Canada, even from the fact we have universal health care, which is an NDP policy that we put forward uh, you know, by Tommy Douglas, this sh- demonstrates that in Canada, our history is different than America, and I don't think we can compare ourselves exactly to them. But if we look at the Canadian situation, look at our history, I think our province is, is and our nation is always better when we elect more NDP uh, in, in the legislature or in the House of Commons and when we form NDP governments. Um, where'd you grow up? So I have a pretty interesting story of where I grew up. I was born in St. John's, Newfoundland. And so I was actually, I'm a, you You're know, a I went to, I'm a Newfie. I went to Newfoundland, Newfoundland uh, a couple of years ago on my, it was my first, I think it's a uh, coming home trip or something. It's called uh, your, you know, when you, when you go back to Newfoundland for your first time. And there's this thing called getting screeched in. I don't know if you've ever been to Newfoundland and you've heard of this, this tradition called, called being screeched in. Where you ki- kiss the cod. Yeah, you kiss the cod. Yeah. So when I was there, they kept on saying to my brother, oh, you got to get, you know, the, 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 you know, they asked me, were you born in Newfoundland? He's like, I grew up in Newfoundland, but, you know, I wasn't born here. So they said, you know, there's some debate whether he get screeched in or not. But for me, they're like, well, you were born here. You don't got to get screeched in. You're bona fide. They kept on saying, I'm a bona fide Newfie. So I was born in Newfoundland. I was there for a short period of time. There's actually a really cute photo we have at home of my uh, brother, my sister, and I um, playing in front of Bowering Park, which is a you know very famous park in uh, St. John's. And then after that, we moved to Windsor. So I grew up the bulk of my uh, teenage years, I would say, uh, from when I was you know probably three or four till fifteen. I was uh, the bulk of my younger years, I should say rather. I was in Windsor. Then I moved to London, Ontario, from when I was fifteen to like eighteen. And then I moved to Hamilton, Ontario from when I was 18 to like 21, 22 for my university degree. And then we made our way here to the Peel region. And what did you take at university? So I have a pretty random uh, background in, um, in you know, what I chose to study. My brother had always encouraged me. He said, you know, Gretchen, you have to study what you love. And so he never really pushed me to, you know, my brother had had a bit of a father figure to me. He was, my father is, uh, you know, he, he's someone who is, he was going through a lot of health issues and he was struggling. So my brother filled that role. And uh, my brother had always told me, like, you got to just study what you love. And so I randomly just started to really love religion. So I actually had a undergraduate, a BA honors in religious studies prior to going to law school. And uh, you didn't want to go into, uh, what is it? Is it priesthood within secret? Yeah, I would. I did. So in, in, uh, it, it, there wasn't, there's not much of an institution for for that kind of work here, but I, I just studied out of interest. Like I, it wasn't something that I literally just took the, 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 uh, it wasn't because I was looking for a job or like, it wasn't, you know, based on a career, it was based on interest in, and I, I you know, I really said, just study what you love. And so I wasn't studying based on, you know, what kind of employability I, ha- I would have. I just studied something that I really was interested in. And then afterwards, when I was, you know, looking on what to do for a living and, and what kind of profession I liked, I chose to do law. And it worked great because I, I, it gave me a lot of understanding of the world, of individuals, of people, their belief systems. Uh, and also, like, I've had to read, my, my, for four years, I had to read majority of the world's major religious texts. That was something that I wrote essays on and I had to read cover to cover. And that's something I pretty, have a pretty good, you know, working knowledge of. And so, um, yeah, I, I, it was just something I like to do. And, and I still have a really big interest in it. So I'm actually always... In my free time, I, as nerdy as it sounds, I often read and listen to uh, commentary on like contemporary religious anal- uh, analysis and religious texts and theology. Like I find it really interesting. Is your Sikh religion important to you? My Sikh spirituality is very, very important to me. It's something that uh, it you know it, it motivates a lot of my actions that I do. You know, as a Sikh, something we we believe in every day. We do this um, you know, this prayer to the universe, to the, the energy that connects us all. And we ask for the, for the uh, upliftment of all humanity and a part of social justice and fighting against injustice, a big part of our spirituality and uplifting all of humanity, irrespective of your religion, your background, your creed, your gender, any of it, we believe in, in uplifting humanity and fighting against injustice. So uh, a lot of the work that I do day to day, I gain a lot of inspiration from the fact that for me, it's a part of my identity to stand up against injustice. 
religion and spiritualism has been important to me my whole life. I, uh, you know, went to church. I went to youth group. I, uh, I've preached in, uh, in different uh, denominations within the Christian faith. Oh wow! Um, and uh, and yet a lot of extremists within different religions, and not just Christianity, but a whole bunch of different religions, um, to me, give religion a bad name, give spirituality a bad name. Why is it that uh, these extremists um, that maybe take literal uh, readings of different books have uh, actually often, to me, don't show love? You know, I always say, I think they're the, they are the few and we are the many. I think the vast majority of folks in, in any faith when they connect to it, they gain a lot of positivity, right? They gain a lot of connection and ideas of service and, and helping one, one another. I think that's the, the core messages of religions across the world. And I think that's the, that's the majority of folks and what they, what they get from religion. And I think there's a few in, in any ideology, really, that, uh, you know, take it to a, a negative route. But I think the vast majority of folks who are connected, um, you know, use it as a, as a motivation to help those who are in need. So why did you um, choose to uh, to go from religion to law? Uh, I, you know, I guess there's a lot of, uh, there could be a lot of interesting commentary on, you know, for a lot of religions, there's a lot of similarities between religion and law, right? When you look at uh, different religious texts and, and you know, different uh, uh, scriptures that are written. But, uh, I, you know, it was, I think there was a big part of it around that whole idea of wanting to fight for uh, a better world and fighting for justice and being able to be an advocate and realize the understanding that everything we do in this world is uh, mandated and often uh, it's, it, there's no laws that impact everything we do. So um, I presume you weren't working for a big downtown corporate law firm. I know I was, I was, I was, I, you know, I, I, I actually uh, did my, my four years in, in law school and afterwards I went to, yeah, I worked for my long, long time, my brother for a bit and then I was in private practice and I wasn't doing, uh, you know, you're right. I wasn't doing big corporate laws. I was, I was trying to help those who are in need and I did a lot of advocacy I did a lot of trial work and I was the real big focus of it was trying to help those in need. So actually I worked for a brief period with uh, James Lockyer, who's uh, you know, one of the, he, he's an individual who founded the, uh, he, he does a lot of work on those who are wrongfully convicted. And so he's a pretty prominent lawyer. I worked at his firm for a bit and a lot of my focus around social justice and then um, then that led to politics. So that was kind of the path that, that I went on. So why the change from law where it seems like you were having an impact to, to politics? So what, while I was in law, you know, I always uh, laugh at this experience where the day I got called to the bar in 2011, I remember that day very vividly because in the morning I woke up and I drove down to Roy Thompson Hall for uh, the call ceremony. And then I quickly was with my brother and my family and we had a meal. And then I went back to Brampton and I was door knocking for my brother's election because it was during his first provincial run. So it was, uh, and it was right off, like, you know, he ran federally first and he lost just by 500 votes. And I was writing my bar at that time, at the same time as helping him. So I was kind of doing double duty. And it was a crazy time with very few hours of sleep and a lot of work, uh, everything combined. And then I, I continued uh, studying for my bars. And in October, when he was running for his election, that was when my call ceremony happened. So uh, politics and law were always side by side, everything I was doing. I was helping my brother out at the same time I was practicing. And I saw the connection, right? You know, at one point, members of the bar often, you know, talk about how politics, is, you know, politics is, is strengthened when we have a lot of lawyers in the legislature because we, we understand the law, we study the law. And what we do as, as lawmakers, we make laws and we understand the impact of it. So I saw a direct connection there. It, it connected also to my issues around my, my, you know, my interest in social justice and the passion I have for social justice. So. I encouraged my brother to get into it. And then when he went off to uh, leadership and he got elected and the seat was vacant, my brother actually turned around to me and he said to me, he said, um, you know, we work so hard and we create such a strong progressive movement in Brampton and we need to continue uh, ensuring that people have a strong voice. And, he, you know, he's like, you worked really hard in the riding and I've door knocked that riding, you know, numerous times because we're involved in so many elections so I, you know, when I was running my first time, I knew a lot of the folks at door knock because they had seen me in, in my capacity of helping my brother in the pre previous elections. So there's a lot of connection and familiarity and I knew the issues and I want to fight for Brampton. I felt like Brampton has been and continues to be left behind with our healthcare crisis. We have one hospital for over 600,000 people. We're underfunded and these are issues that have not been resolved and I want to uh, work to address because Brampton deserves better. So where does this uh, social 
progressive passion come from? Does it come from uh, your religious training? Does it come from your legal work? Does it come from your upbringing? Um, tell me where it comes from. I think it comes from all of them. I think you, you really kind of just, you know, connect them all together. Uh, I attribute a lot to uh, my high school teachers, actually. I went to uh, public school in London, Ontario, and I had three teachers. And I don't think they know, actually, how much of an impact they had on me. And then by association, my brother, I had Mr. Main, Mr. Black, and Mr. Power. And they were three teachers who, and, and I should actually so say, I'll say Ms. Farrow was actually a really amazing uh, uh, teacher as well. And they really encouraged me to think critically, to think about a better world, a more just world. And those teachers had a really huge impact on my life and how I perceive the world and how I perceive injustice and how I really think that no one should be put in a position where they have to struggle for basic things like housing or education or, you know, the fact that our healthcare system is so amazing because it takes care of everyone and we can strengthen and expand it and really imagine what is a better province look like and a better world looks like. So they really encouraged me and I, my mom always taught me, my brother often talks, talks about this as well, that we're all one, we're all connected. And the fact that we're all one, we're all connected is something that encourages me. My Sikh spirituality teaches me to fight against injustice. That's something that is foundational to who I am. So all these factors, uh, being a lawyer, you know, lawyers are known for me, advocates. And that's something that uh, it gave me the tools to be able to communicate, understand, you know, what's holding people back. So I, I really think you're touching on all the points. Everything really uh, helped put me in a position where, uh, you know, I, I wanted to fight for people and, and fight against those things that hold people back. You know, a lot of the things that you're saying talk about uh, the importance of community, of, of, of everyone together, of working together, of helping everyone together. And again, and maybe unfair, but uh, I'm looking to the United States, uh, there seems to have been, and we see it in Canada as well with some of these protests, this uh, sort of separation between the people that are worried about the community and the whole and these others that are uh, maybe on the right that are so much more concerned about capitalism and uh, independence and freedom and individual rights. If you meet someone at the door, it's in that sort of individual rights, freedom, uh, capitalist. Uh, uh, how do you explain your positioning to them and why you're right and they're wrong? I, I think it just comes down to this idea. I think, so one thing um, that I'm thankful of is that even in, in, in as you, you know, you described uh, in, in America, it's a far more polarized situation and their right is a very different right than I think the right in Canada. I think in, in Canada, what makes us a, a beautiful country is that we have, uh, you know, the overall, there's, I think, less polarization and our belief systems are more, uh, you know, there's a lot less of a, it's compared to America, like we have a lot of work we need to do in Canada as well, but there's less of a drastic uh, dichotomy uh, when compared to America, when you look at that kind of, the, the huge polarization of America versus Canada. I think it's a good thing that in Canada, we, we have more common ground. So when I talk to folks, like when you talk about Brampton, and this is, the, this is really interesting in Brampton, when you knock on anyone's door in Brampton, and whether they, they identify as a conservative, a liberal, or an NDP, when you say in Brampton, should we have another hospital? They'll all say yes. It is wrong. No, I've never, I've never met anyone in Brampton who's ever said, no, one hospital is good enough for us. Well, building another hospital, public hospital, that's a progressive value, right? When I say Brampton, uh, we need to control auto insurance, and we need to make sure the government steps in to regulate uh, auto insurance because people are getting uh, robbed right now by billion dollar insurance companies. I've never even heard a, con a conservative say, yeah, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the, <laughs> with the rates I'm, I'm paying. They'll say, yeah, you're right. The government needs to step in and do something. Well, that's a progressive value of, you know, having a government do some intervening in the, free, in the free market and saying, no, this is not actually a free market because the result of it is people are being unfairly treated. So when you talk to uh, conservatives, even in Brampton, they are, there. a lot of them have, progressive values, but they just, you know, they, they maybe have allegiances to a specific party. But when you talk with the actual values, they, they we all want the same thing in Brampton. We want to have a healthy community where we're not going to one overcrowded and underfunded hospital. We want to live in an affordable community that has, you know, auto insurance rates that are being regulated and controlled. We want to have, you know, a strong transit system, safe community, safe cities. So th that's the common ground that I'm seeing. Yeah, we have a lot more that connects us in our city than, uh, than, than sets us apart from one another. We're chatting tonight with uh, Guratan Singh. He is the member of provincial parliament in Brampton East, the uh, critic for attorney general for the new democratic party in uh, Queens Park. We're gonna take a break and then come back and I'm gonna ask him a couple of questions about some specific policies. Stay with us. 
Welcome back to the Brian Cranby Radio Hour Saga 960. Um, interesting conversation tonight with Guritan Singh. He is the member of Provincial Parliament, Brampton East, a uh, critic for Attorney General, uh, has told us an interesting uh, backstory about uh, uh, growing up in Newfoundland and uh, Windsor and London and Hamilton and then Brampton and uh, doing religious studies and then uh, legal studies and then becoming a politician. He's got a pretty uh, broad uh, experience set. Um, Guritan, let me ask you a couple of questions. Uh, so, you know, one of the the big issues, I think uh, Trudeau, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau just made an announcement this past week um, about uh, infrastructure spending being targeted at uh, climate change. What do you think about the provincial government's current strategy in regards to, uh, to, to climate change? They've been opposing the uh, carbon tax that the, the federal government was wanting to impose. They uh, wrote off a bunch of the the um, alternative energy programs that the prior liberal government provincially had. What do you think about our current strategy in Ontario in regards to climate change and, uh, and greenhouse gases, uh, environmentalism, et cetera? So we have to start off by saying and acknowledging that uh, in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, we can never forget the climate crisis and that this is one of the biggest, if not the biggest uh, crisis that humanity is facing right now. And that, uh, you know, there's a light at the end of the tunnel uh, with the COVID-19 crisis, as, as tough as it is as, and as bad as it's impacting folks. Uh, but right now with our climate crisis, there's not enough action being done uh, across the world to ensure that our world is safe and that people are, are being taken care of and that our future, like, you know, I always talk about, I'm a new father now. And more than, like, more than ever now, I think about the world that my daughter is going to be inheriting and the responsibility I have and that we all have to ensure that you know, the environment, something we all rely on is around. And when we look at Doug Ford's, uh, the Conservative government's uh, actions, since quite frankly, day one, it's not been in line with protecting our environment. And in, instead, we're, as you clearly articulated, we've seen a lot of policies being put forward that are combating initiatives and combating uh, policy that would protect our environment. And that's the wrong direction. We need to do more for the environment. We need to also understand that creating a stronger environment is gonna help our economy. It's gonna create a, you know, a whole new area of jobs. It's a, it's a, it's a grower to our economy. It's gonna create a healthier and better society. And that's where we need to be investing. The, I'm really proud of the fact that the Ontario New Democrats, we've just put forward the Ontario New Democratic Green Deal. And in it, we're really uh, putting forth strong targets to become carbon neutral, to, to ensure that our province is going in that correct direction to protect our, our environment. And if, you know, if the NDP had formed government or if the NDP was in power, that's the kind of province we'd be uh, building, one that respected and protected our environment. As you may know, I spent some time knocking on doors, uh, sort of in your area, in uh, the Moulton part of what was at one point in time, the Mississauga Brampton South uh, riding um, that I guess now you've got Brampton uh, East uh, uh, just above that. Um, and, you know, there's a bit of big business uh, around the airport, but the vast majority of people that, uh, that I uh, met when I was knocking on doors were either uh, owners of small businesses or working for small businesses, uh, whether they be retail businesses or a whole slew of logistics businesses and small manufacturing businesses and, and things like that. Um, COVID-19 has unbelievably dramatically negatively impacted them. Do you think the government has had the right strategy in regards to our close downs of small businesses? So when it comes to close downs uh, and lockdowns, that's something I always say that we have to listen, listen to the experts and whatever the experts put forward, that's something that uh, you know, the, health, the health professionals know best and we should follow their advice. But one thing that we've been saying from day one is that small businesses are struggling right now and small businesses are not getting the supports that they require. You really clearly describe the nature of a lot of folks in Malton and Brampton across the board, a lot of small business owners, a lot of people who are essential workers, a lot of people who are owner operators and trucking. So they, you know, they, the lifestyle is one of uh, someone who's you know, waking up every day and, and, and driving a truck, but they're actually a small business owner because of the nature of how they own their truck and how it's being contracted out. And those small businesses are not getting the support they need. They're not. And we have put forth in the NDP time and time again, proposals like Save Main Street to provide support for small businesses who are struggling to no fault of their own. They're struggling because of this COVID-19 pandemic, which has really uh, wreaked havoc upon the world and Ontario. And what we've seen from the Conservative uh, government and Doug Ford is no action at all. They've literally done nothing to address this issue. And if anything, they're actually, the FAO just came out with a report, $12 billion has been given to the province, $12 billion 
for COVID-19 support, including supports that could have gone to small businesses to do things that the NDB is proposing, things like uh, you know, rental relief or uh, you know, providing supports to small businesses who are struggling. But instead, the Conservative government decided to do nothing, sit on this money while small businesses are having to struggle with COVID-19 on their own. That's the wrong direction. That's not what we should be doing as a province. And frank, frankly, if the NDP was in power, we'd be ensuring that that federal money was being used to help those who are in need right now. The Auditor General's report on how the province dealt with COVID-19 was, was reasonably uh, negative. Uh, did you agree with it? I think that uh, the province has not done what, it, uh, the, you know, Doug Ford and the Conservatives have not done what they needed to do or should have done to help people out in one of the most drastic times we've ever experienced in, in, in my lifetime and in, in recent history. And um, I agree that it's more, you know, we've been kind of ringing the bells. We've been yelling from the rooftop saying, we need to do more. We need to do more, be it more testing, more healthcare support, hiring more personal support workers. Do, like, look what we're seeing in our long-term care homes right now. We're literally seeing the same devastation that we saw just a couple of months ago when the first wave hit. And then the second wave, we're seeing that devastation again. It's, it's like the conservatives didn't learn, learn anything from the first time around. They're pinching pennies out of the back of people who are struggling. And the end result is that where people are losing lives and people are losing their livelihoods. And that's wrong. And that's something that if the NDP was in power, we'd be you putting that money to, to, to use. We'd be helping folks and uh, we'd be ensuring that people have the support that they need right now. I'm not sure what the current numbers are, but uh, after the spring surge, 80% uh, of all the deaths uh, in Ontario occurred within long-term care. Isn't that a tragedy? It, it is a devastating tragedy. I'm actually in my riding right now. I'm dealing with, a, there's a, a long-term care facility that has an outbreak right now with countless lives being lost. It is a huge tragedy. We're talking about people, seniors who have spent their whole life building our province, putting us in the position we are today. And in their last days when they should have the support and they should be able to you know, experience their last days with a degree of dignity. They're, if you read the, the army report on the state that seniors are being kept in, it was gut-wrenching. It was terrible, it was unjust. And that is something that it is a huge tragedy, it's an injustice, and quite frankly, it falls at the feet of the premier. And the premier, Doug Ford, has not done enough to protect those who are so vulnerable. And that's something that you know, we put forth strong uh, suggestions and strong uh, you know, policy to the government saying you need to act more immediately. We need to actually protect those who are in care, but instead we're not seeing that kind of protection put forward and the end result is more lives are being lost. I've had some people that uh, are very opposed to all of the stringent measures that uh, the government has taken uh, and public health uh, people have been recommending and have pointed out that 80% of the people that have passed away um, have been in long-term care. And you quote the statistic that something like 75% of all those people had dementia and over 50% of those people had uh, um, contra, uh, um, other, uh, other challenges. And so while they may have uh, um, accelerated their death because of COVID-19, they were probably going to die anyway. Um, and so I guess for some reason, they think that that's less impactful than if it was uh, mortality um, that uh, the whole population uh, were, uh, were uh, being impacted by. How do you respond to someone like that? I say just look at the facts, listen to the public health experts who are saying that no one is, uh, there's no one who's free from the impacts of COVID-19, that we're seeing young people who are being in infected, we're seeing people of all ages who are being really devastated and hurt by the sickness. And think of it collectively. Like we have to understand that we have a responsibility to protect one another. And I talk, talk about Brampton all the time. And I'll say right now, our hospital is so overcrowded uh, because of the impact of COVID-19, the patients are not being shipped to other hospitals outside of the city. COVID-19 is real, its impact is real. The public health experts are demonstrating the gravity of it and it's, it's, it's hurting people. And our healthcare system is being overburdened by this. And when we have a system that's already stretched to the limits getting hurt further, that's gonna have uh, an impact on everyone and it's gonna have impact on our overall quality of health. So we have to really be responsible to those folks that would say, don't just think about yourself, think about others and understand that we have all a responsibility right now to take care of one another uh, now more than ever. And I would just say, turn to that part and look at the health, public health experts, look at the recommendations. They're saying very clearly that you know, these precautions are important and we need to do more not right now, not less. You've mentioned a few times that Brampton only has one hospital. I uh, used to be chairman of the Western GTA Summit, which included uh, Brampton. And the statistic at that time was that if you wanted affordable housing, 
uh, supplied for by uh, government or social services. There was an 18 year waiting list for affordable wow. housing. Um, and uh, there was a organization um, uh, from Peel uh, in regards to a fair share for Peel that yep. uh, had uh, per capita analyses of how much monies uh, Peel got for social services, mental health, healthcare, et cetera, that were dramatically less than uh, Toronto and other places around the, uh, the province got. Why? Why is Peel being shortchanged? Why is Brampton being shortchanged? Are you not doing your job? So you, you said it really clearly that, um, you know, Brampton is not, and Peel is not getting its fair share. Uh, fair share, fair share of Peel is, is very clearly uh, articulating the issues um, that Brampton has been facing and Peel has been facing with respect to funding. And, you know, I need to always remind folks that uh, my role is I'm in opposition. And so I don't uh, ultimately have the direct power to, you know, designate where funding goes. That's in the hand of the government. That's in the hand of the current uh, conservative government and previous liberal governments. And the reality is they have left Peel behind. They have left us uh, in a position right now in Brampton where they've decided to not uh, fund our healthcare system adequately. This crisis didn't happen overnight. It's happened with years of neglect. And we've been, you know, ringing the bells and we've been creating the awareness around it. But that's why what we're saying to folks is to really impact this and really create change. If we want to get the funding that Peel needs uh, and desperately uh, deserves, that we need to we need to elect an NDP uh, government that they'll actually put this policy in place and ensure that folks are getting the funding that's required. And that's what I'm really working for. That's what I'm really encouraged for. I'm, I'm fighting hard to elect Andrew Horvath as our next premier. So we can ensure that Peel no longer gets left behind and Brampton gets the funding in healthcare and overall that we deserve. I've interviewed a couple of developers and, uh, and architects and city planners uh, in the Brampton area. And they talk about how um, you know, a, a, a fast train between uh, downtown Brampton and Union Station, um, development of downtown Brampton, uh, university, uh, revitalization of, uh, of, uh, of the area would be some of the things that would really do more from an economic development standpoint for Brampton than almost anything else. Um, do you agree? 100%. Uh, I've, we've been a strong advocate for the LRT, which would have connected. Uh, it's still being built, obviously, but it would have, would have connected from for credit all the way up to downtown Brampton. I was saying that was something that our city needs. Uh, we need a university as well in Brampton. That's a, an issue that, with given the current issue of COVID-19, uh, is not at much at the forefront, given the fact that a lot of people are learning electronically, but it's something that once we're done COVID-19, it's going to go back to the fact that Brampton not only doesn't have the healthcare support, we don't have the educational investment. We are a city of over 600,000 that, you know, young folks are in a really tough position as they're commuting every day to get their education and living outside the city and, and all the costs that are associated with living away from home when they're often unable to afford that. These are all things that are really negatively impacting folks. And Brampton could be so much better if we got the support we needed. But instead, we saw, you know, right before the shovels were to, you know, they, they'd already hit the ground in many places. And overnight, uh, we saw in Brampton and Markham and Milton, universities being canceled by Doug Ford and the Conservatives. That's the wrong direction. We need to be thinking of how to create more uh, economic development in Brampton. And there's the number was, you know, it, it, it saved the province. I think Brampton was, you know, in the, in the uh, tens of millions for can canceling the university, but in the long run, it would have created hundreds of millions of economic impact in Brampton and in, and in growth. So it's really a short sighted decision when they decided to cancel the university in Brampton and in Markham and Milton, these are economic boomers. There's something that create jobs. They create uh, just a more, a more robust and vibrant city. And we're seeing, once again, the Conservative government taking actions, which is holding Brampton back. One of the big issues a year ago, which seems, you know, given that it was pre-COVID-19, like it was a, a century ago, but one of the big issues a year ago was uh, a concern that uh, the Doug Ford uh, government was going to be doing amalgamation. Uh, in 1997, Ann Golden, who was chair of the GTA task force, recommended amalgamation Toronto, which was actually implemented, but also amalgamation of Brampton and Mississauga into a new city, um, uh, Halton into one city, York into one city, and Durham into one city, and then the creation of a new metro council that would have five mayors um, from these four new cities and the, and the city of Toronto. And her argument was that right now, um, 29 mayors and chairs sit down with the mayor of uh, Toronto and the premier of Ontario, and clearly the mayor of Toronto um, is the, the only one that has a major scale. And so therefore uh, all the attention, all the uh, weight, all the votes uh, are uh, paid there. And, uh, and if you put Mississauga and Brampton together, it would be 1.1 uh, 
uh, 3 million people, it would be the third largest city in Ontario, the fifth largest city in Canada. Do you think that makes any sense to think about amalgamation, um, given that we're one economic region? Or should we just stay Brampton, Markham? Yeah. I think, it's, I think it's a really interesting uh, proposal before, but I think when you talk to folks, by and large, uh, there's folks who understand that the, uh, the realities, the economic realities, the lifestyle in, in Brampton is dramatically different than Mississauga and different areas. And I think when you have more of a local representation, you're able to speak directly to the issues that impact the community and impact that, uh, that city and the folks from that, from that area. So I think we need to, you know, ultimately these are decisions that are up to, should be put to the people. People should make those decisions. But I'm a proud Bramptonian, and uh, I hope to continue uh, representing Brampton as a city. Former Mayor Hazel McCallion told me it was the smartest thing to, to happen to the GTA, and it would make a ton of sense, but that no one would recommend it because it would be political suicide because people are proud Bramptonians and proud Mississaugans. And she said it would be comparable to how people hate it when streets fill port credit, um, Cooksville, et cetera, all merged into Mississauga, and then all, a year later, they were all happy to be it. Anyway, um, what do you think is, uh, is the biggest transit change that would happen to Brampton that would be a game changer for you? I think right now we should talk about like from a transit perspective, the opportunity that was put forward to us that uh, uh, city council, uh, the previous city council had initially uh, voted down, which was the LRT. That would have been uh, something from a, like, you know, that's, a, that's a, an, a plan that was put forward and the hope was the funding was there as well to, to bring an LRT from Port Credit to downtown Brampton. That's something that before even being elected, I was a big advocate for the LRT. I thought that was something that was really, really important because uh, we look at how there's a lot of integration in this GTHA and the integration from a transportation perspective, economic perspective, lifestyle perspective, you have friends all over the region and having transportation help facilitate that would be really important. I, I, uh, LRT connecting, um, uh, you know, downtown Brampton to through downtown Mississauga to Fort Credit and to the, uh, you know, the goal lines there and all the just general integration to Hamilton and everywhere, I think would have been fantastic. And that's something that, um, you know, the, that's is something that the previous city council obviously wears. And uh, I think that's something that we, 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 you know, that at a minimum is what we need, but ultimately we need more investment in transit and we need more uh, you know, BRTs and LRTs and all these kind of investments to ensure that we, we recognize and realize that you, the stronger transportation system you have, the less cars you have on the road, the less traffic you have for those who are driving, the easier uh, ability to get around you have for those who will rely on public transportation. And I think a robust and strong public transit system around the world has been shown to create more economic uh, advantages and also just even lifestyle, health, everything. There's so many positive connections to that. So I'm, I'm a big fan of that project. I think they uh, create more livable, walkable, enjoyable, sociable cities. Work, live and play, right? That's the whole, that's the whole, um, you know, future. Even right now, you look at the Mississauga plan that's put forward, the nodes, I believe it's called, where they're trying to make uh, every, I think, traditional village that was there, they're trying to make it into a work, live, play uh, area. So people can have that, you know, more livable nature. I think that's the future of cities. And we should be encouraging that through the investment of public transportation. And I think that one plan would have been a good starter to really you know, show people's imagination. This is what an integrated transit system could look like across the GTHA. We're chatting tonight with Guratan Singh. He is the member of provincial parliament for Brampton East, uh, the uh, critic for the attorney general, member of the New Democratic Party in Ontario. We're gonna take a break and come back with some final concluding comments in just a minute. Stay with us. Welcome back. Uh, we're chatting tonight with Guratan Singh, member of provincial parliament for Brampton East. We've been having, I think, a really interesting conversation about his background, um, uh, religious studies, legal studies, being a lawyer, being a politician, his uh, attitude toward a whole bunch of different policies, which uh, clearly on the progressive um, uh, side of, of, uh, of the political spectrum, but really quite interesting. So Guratan, if, if you were premier, what would be your vision? What would be your key policies? So I, I have to just change that question a little bit, and I'll say, you know, with when Andrea Horvath is premier, because I'm I'm fighting really hard to get. Okay, 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 it. fine. When Andrea Horvath is premier, what would you and Andrea want to do? So you know, I think Andrea has really put forth a really strong vision for what uh, a better province could look like. And every time we look at all the issues that we've been facing under this COVID nineteen crisis, you know, as you describe, 
we've seen the, the AG's report about the fact that the current Conservative government has not done what folks really need to, uh, at this time of crisis. And what we've seen Andrew Horvath and her leadership, what we, 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 what we would have seen with, as her as premier is ensuring that small businesses get the support they need, ensuring that people who are struggling get the support they need, ensuring that those who had fallen through the cracks of CERB had provincial support system. Keep in mind that there's provinces across Canada who are providing their own support systems and Ontario did not do that. Ontario did not have, Doug Ford and the Conservatives didn't have their own uh, small business support plan or folks uh, who are in need support plan. We would have been making sure we have higher testing, higher supports. We would have hired PSWs to ensure that this, uh, the crisis in our long-term care homes would have been addressed. That's the leadership that Andrea has been putting forward. And that's the kind of province that we deserve. And I'm really excited to, to be working alongside Andrea to elect her as our next premier so we can ensure that people of Ontario get the better province that we all need and deserve. Guritan, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, just before we go, we're heading into uh, holiday season uh, where people are worried about an uh, uh, increase in infection. Do you have a message for everyone around this time? Uh, I just have to say to everyone, we need to listen to the public health experts. We need to do everything we can to control COVID-19. Uh, there is a light at the end of the tunnel with a vaccine, but we can't uh, let up the need to be responsible right now. So I know it's tough, but you know, by this time next year, Hopefully, if everything goes smooth, we'll be back with our loved ones and family for the next holiday season. But for this holiday season, we need to ensure we follow the rules by uh, public health experts and you know, ensure that we're doing everything we can to stop the spread of COVID-19. I also want to give you a big shout out, uh, Brian. This is a really fantastic interview. It was really wonderfully done. You asked fantastic questions. So you're clearly a pro at this, brother. So I really appreciate that. Uh, my time. Well, I got to tell you something. I appreciate that, Gertan. But, and I can't even remember now when it was, but uh, um, the first time that your brother ran provincially, I was uh, moderating a debate in, uh, I think it was Mississauga City Hall. Uh, and uh, um, for the whole Peel region, each party got to uh, um, recommend uh, politicians. And Charles Souza was the person the Liberal Party chose and the New Democratic Party chose your brother to come and uh, speak. And I got to ask questions. And at the end of it, I said to him, this is a young man that I am incredibly impressed with and we are going to see great things from in the future. And that's what I said. When was that? Six, seven years ago. I can't remember around when. Uh, I have to tell the whole world listening tonight that uh, Guritan Singh is an impressive young man. And this is someone that we're going to be uh, paying attention to a lot in the future. I look forward to watching you uh, as you have a profound impact on uh, Brampton and Ontario. Thank you so much for everything that you do. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. That's a really big honor and I, I really appreciate those kind words. Good night, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm on every Monday through Friday at six o'clock on Saga 960 AM or streamed online at www.saga960am.ca or you can get all my podcasts and videocasts on briancrombie.com. Good night, everybody. <laughs>